my name is David Tolley. I'm with uh, Salesforce.com. If you were in this uh, talk previously, uh, Jim Evans is from Salesforce.com as well. It's almost like we sponsored the, uh, the talk or something. Um, but anyways, uh, I'm on something called the Productivity Cloud at Salesforce. Uh, it's a pretty interesting uh, group that I work with. We don't really create features that you all as cu potential customers uh, would interact with. Uh, we create features and stories that help our engineers to be more productive. Uh, so things like faster results uh, for your commits, uh, more reliable results. So instead of having to debug your uh, test results and you know, figure out if it was an infrastructure failure or a real test failure, um, our team you know, helps with that. We try and make a developer's life easier. Um, not only that, but we experiment with new technologies. Um, I can't really get into any specifics, but uh, anytime a new technology comes out, like, like Greg Wester over here, uh, he loves new, new, new and shiny things. Uh, so anything, anytime something new comes out, he jumps on the wagon. Uh, we experiment with it, do a proof of concept, uh, give it to people if they like it, awesome. Uh, some examples of, of things that we've done is something called strict unit test where if anything in the JVM tries to access uh, anything on, like an I.O. or something like that outside of the uh, space, uh, it'll just fail the test. Um, not only that, we uh, created a, a new JUnit 4 framework at Salesforce, uh, migrating from an older JUnit 3 framework. Uh, that was all handled by, by our testing cloud. Uh, one thing I, I just want to give a little bit of a disclaimer, Salesforce is a really huge company. Um, all the data and all the metrics that I'm going to be talking about it just has to do with our platform. Uh, Salesforce has been around for over 10 years. Uh, we own a bunch of different companies like Heroku, uh, Exact Target, and these aren't s small companies. They have hundreds of employees or thousands of employees. Uh, Salesforce.com itself has, I don't know, 13, 14,000 employees. Um, but just a little disclaimer, I'm just talking about the platform right here. Before I get into the history of Salesforce, um, I just kind of want to give a little bit of recognition to Simon and Jim and the, uh, the rest of the committers here. Um, in his keynote, he mentioned something. There's something along the lines of two or three times more jobs for Selenium and WebDriver than there was for some other uh, testing frameworks. And you know, a lot of people give them grief. You know, they either love WebDriver or they hate WebDriver. Some people call it a necessary evil. But uh, I'm able to uh, provide for my family because of them. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you here are able to do the same thing. So just give them a round of applause and just, uh, you know, they help our lives. Let's give them a little bit of a round of applause. So uh, Selenium has a really uh, interesting history at, at Salesforce. We're one of the early adopters, and I'll be talking about how extensive our test suite is, but um, around 2008, uh, one of our, our sole distinguished engineer now, uh, Doug Chasman, said, you know, it'd be great if we could test our UI. Um, so they, you know, looked at Selenium RC, they did a proof of concept, and it went really viral. Um, the great thing about Selenium is it's so easy to write a test. You don't need to worry about dependency injection. You don't need to worry about your code being, you know, testable. You don't need to write your code in a way that other people can write a code. I mean, you're dealing with a UI. If you can look at a UI, if you can, you know, open up a browser, you can write a test for it. So it had really awesome, really quick developer adoption which is okay in a certain respect, you know, it's good, we're, we're getting more tests, you know, we're testing our application. But Selenium RC is very, very flaky. Um, we spend almost as much time writing new code as we do, you know, maintaining our existing test suites. So around 2012, we have about 15,000 Selenium tests. And for most people here, 15,000 is kind of a ridiculous number. But it's okay because today we have around 50,000 Selenium tests. Uh, not only that, we have uh, two committers on uh, Salesforce payroll. Uh, Jim Evans and uh, Luke Edmund uh, Samru that uh, Jim talked about. And unlike some companies, every single one of our uh, Selenium tests is run through our CI process. So every single commit that goes through CI, every time uh, someone checks in code, it's being tested against you know 50,000 Selenium tests and all of our other test suites as well. It's a pretty cool concept. So Salesforce engineering is just the platform is pretty huge. We have over a thousand engineers. You know, we have architects that, um, you know, they drive our scale. Um, they make sure that whatever we're trying to do now is gonna be a scale in the future. Um, they drive our overall design. 
And then we have the feature developers, you know, they create the new features, they create the enhancements. Um, they're chiefly responsible for the unit test and some integration tests. But the really cool thing about Salesforce is our quality engineers are just as important and even in some respects more important than our feature developers. Um, you know, we ensure product quality uh, through test automation. So we don't rely on a lot of manual testing and manual testing just doesn't scale. Um, of course, whenever new features and new, new enhancements or release goes out, you need, you need to do some type of light uh, manual testing. But for the most part, every single one of our Q engineers is a developer in their own right. But instead of feature code, they're writing test automation code. Um, they're, they're chiefly responsible for the integration test and uh, almost solely for the uh, UI functional tests. Uh, so Selenium, WebDriver, uh, you know, those different types, uh, testing frameworks. We also have hundreds of projects. Um, the project team size ranges from one to 10 people, 10 plus people. And it's pretty cool that I say one person. And there's a really cool, uh, cool thing about Salesforce and being an engineer at Salesforce is we have something called PT on. So if you have a really fantastic idea or something maybe that's outside the box or something you're like, no, this isn't working, I, I wanna fix it. Management will give you the time or there's a day, you know, a week, you know, a month, you know, depending on you know, what type of scale it's gonna be. They say, okay, you have time, go make a proof of concept, let's see how it goes. So there's many, many um, like small one or two person teams at Salesforce where they're just like prototyping these concepts, prototyping these new technologies, uh, working on some new cool features and that's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool thing that we have going on. But not only that, our developers and our QE engineers are, are really tightly integrated. Um, the QEs are involved you know, from the get-go of a new product or, or a new enhancement, a new feature. Uh, they're working with the, uh, the product owner, uh, the project managers, you know, whenever they're developing a new feature, they'll go in there, they'll give their feedback. Um, not only are the developers saying, you know, how long they think it'll take to uh, develop a product, the engineers, the QEs are saying, you know, I think it's gonna take this time, right? Like, not only are you gonna take time to develop it, it's gonna take this, you know, around this amount of time to, uh, to test it, to make sure that it's viable. So each one of our engineers, whether they're developers or, or uh, the QE type, um, they average about two to three commits per day. That's pretty significant when you're talking about over a thousand people, right? So around 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 commits per day, possibly at peak times. And again, every single one of those, you know, 1,000 plus commits goes through our entire CI process. And that's over 450,000 tests. And if each one of those commits were run by themselves, it, somewhere in the neighborhood of one billion tests per day. And that's kind of a big number for people. A lot of people in you know, smaller companies, smaller startups, they kind of shake their head at you know, maybe 500 Selenium tests per day. Um, when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of Selenium tests per day, it's a whole new ball game. There's a whole new level of uh, complexity that goes into it. So the CI process at, at Salesforce is pretty much basically the same as it is with any other, uh, any other company. Um, we're really huge on ag agile development, but we're not so rigid that we say, you know, each team has to be two week sprints or each team has to be three week sprints. Uh, we give the team, you know, the authority to, you know, kind of, you know, pick out their own time frames, right? It's not a really rigid framework. But we do have three major releases per year, uh, every four months. Uh, really big enhancements, really big new features will, will come out to salesforce.com. But along the way, there's a lot of frequent uh, smaller uh, releases as well, almost on a daily basis, whether it's, you know, fixing a, uh, uh, a bug, whether it's a product enhancement, um, whatever needs to happen, we have the ability to release every single day. Along with um, being able to, uh, you know, test order releases, uh, test order commits, uh, test over code changes, um, being a public company, we have to have an audit trail, right? Um, to be SOX clients and all that great stuff. Um, so we have a really cool in-house tool uh, called Gus, and the great thing about that is it's, uh, it's an in, internal um, agile project management system that we developed. It has a really cool sprint wall, um, you can put your stories on there, um, and it provides a really great audit trail. Uh, so whenever you're, uh, you're writing your code and you're trying to commit it, uh, essentially what happens at Salesforce in your commit description, you'll say, you know, what story it's linked to on Gus, um, you know, what your changes is doing, uh, what, sprint, uh, what release it's going to, and then you'll submit it. 
And the cool thing about some of the automation that we have going on there is it'll look at that commit message, it'll go to Gus, look at the API, it'll compare the commit message to, uh, to Gus, you know, do some light verification, make sure that they match up, and, um, and then if it does match up, it'll send it to something that we call pre-check-in. Now, pre-check-in is just a really simple, fast uh, test suite that we have. It, it runs our unit test and it runs our uh, JS unit tests. At Salesforce, um, one of our developers developed something called X, X unit testing framework, where it's a JavaScript unit testing framework. Uh, it's really heavily used at Salesforce. I believe he's open sourced it. It's a, it's a fantastic product. Um, it really helps us along with our Selenium tests uh, to verify that our UI is you know, up, to, up to snuff. So we get that result back in about 30 to 45 minutes, something along those lines. Um, so you know, fairly, fairly quick results back. You get some type of results back. Then if it passes that, it goes into our big integration and functional testing uh, suite. There we have around 200,000 integration tests. Um, so that's a lot of tests. Uh, then we have a, the big, huge, time-consuming chunk of tests of our 50,000 Selenium tests. And it's, it's a lot of tests that we have to deal with. And because of that 50,000 Selenium tests, um, they take a long time to run. So that's one of the main reasons that we can't run all of our tests against every single change list. Essentially what we have to do is we have to take a group of change lists, batch them together, and run our tests against that. So whenever a change list does get run, um, we do some pretty cool things. We try and paralyze it as much as possible. Oh, we have different runs for you know, different flavors of IE, uh, different uh, versions of Firefox, Chrome, Safari. Um, last year, Salesforce released something called Salesforce One, which is our, which is our uh, mobile, um, mobile uh, app for Salesforce. It's a really cool tool. There's a ton of Appium tests that we have for that. Uh, Luke, one of our employees that's a, uh, a committer uh, for Selenium, he's in one of the uh, people in charge of Solenoid. He does a lot of the uh, uh, Android tests for it. Um, so there's a lot of cool things that we try and do to, to paralyze it, and we, we run a lot of tests. But the tipping point is, um, we got to this point where we had a critical mass of tests, right? 50,000 tests running that take 10 hours to run. Uh, we have to batch all these uh, tests together and run. We're not getting any really easy to act on results, right? If you're in a, a, change, a group of change lists that's you know, 10 different change lists, you're getting back 100 different test failures, like it takes a long time to try and figure out, you know, why the test failed, right? It's not, you know, these tests aren't being run on your own change list, so it's not guaranteed that your change list is the one that caused the failure. So there's a lot of logic and some automation that we do to try and figure out what's going on there. Not only that, um, so we run each one of these 50,000 tests, but every time there is a failure, we rerun those failures. It's something that we call flappiness at Salesforce. Some people call it flaky tests, um, but essentially a test will run, It'll fail, we rerun it, and then it passes right. I'm sure a lot of people have experienced that. The longest run takes over 10 hours, and um, again, we, we batch all of these commits together. Um, so when failures do happen, it takes a lot of effort to uh, debug, trying to figure out what happened. And Salesforce is always trying to hire new people. We're trying to scale. We're trying to push out new products, new services as fast as possible. So we needed to not only scale our engineering team, but also our test automation suites. Um, like if results are continually taking 10 hours with 50,000 tests, you can imagine if we had 60 or 70 or, or 100,000 tests uh, whenever we have new features, it, it just doesn't scale well. You know, we're releasing you know, three major releases per, per year. There's, there's a lot of testing that has to go on. And so we needed to, uh, to refactor our longest running test suite, which happened to be Selenium. So I was hired on to Salesforce last September, about a year now. Uh, Greg actually recruited me. And um, my main, the main reason that I came on was trying to refactor our Selenium test suites. It was trying to figure out why our test suite took so long, what we could do to improve it, and what we could do to make it better for the future. And when I got there, everyone had their own ideas of why our test suite took so long. But no one really knew. I'm sure a lot of people here have talked about DevOps, right, or heard the term DevOps. Essentially, that's developers being able to act on data, right? They have access to real-time, pertinent, you know, information of, that, of what their code is doing in production. They can figure out, you know, how many times their uh, code is throwing, throwing errors. Um, 
you know, what type of CPU and I.O. Um, problems they're having. You, you need that same kind of mentality when it comes to refactoring your test suite. You can't just say, the Selenium test is taking a long time. It's because of Selenium RC. Let's delete the whole test suite and move on. You can do that, but that's not a very good way to do. So I needed to get some data. One, one critical fact that we didn't know was how many Selenium RC tests that we had versus how many um, web driver tests that we had. So we need to create some methods around that to generate some data. Um, so that was one of the first things that I had to do. Um, so we had to figure out what metrics you wanted to deal with. Um, we had to figure out you know, what, which tests take the longest. I mean, the main reason that we're refactoring this test suite is because <coughs> it took so long, right? Um, we had to figure out what tests failed the most often. Not only not only does it take up a lot of developer time waiting for you know, long running test suites to come back, but whenever a test fails, often, they have to re, you know, go on there and make frequent changes. That's a, that's a big time sink for, for developers. Uh, which tests are the most flappy? So whenever a test fails and reruns, that's obviously some kind of issue, whether it's a test failure or infrastructure failure. We need to figure out which tests are the flappy, most flappy, that happen more often than other tests. That's something that we should refactor. Uh, and along with having 50,000 tests, there's obviously going to be some type of duplicates in there, right? There's teams that have said, okay, I'm going to write this test for this feature. Two or three years later, someone's like, okay, I'm going to do this as well. You know, there's a lot of duplicates in there. So essentially what we did is, you know, we developed tools and developed uh, methods and, and code to get those metrics for us. And that's the, that was a key critical part in this whole, uh, whole process was developing those metrics and cataloging those metrics. So once we ran all of our tests, ran all the metrics that we needed to get, um, we divided e each test by team. Uh, we sorted them in our uh, backlog, you know, based on those metrics, based on which ones failed the most often, uh, based on which ones took the longest to run. And then we started to act on those tests, right? Um, so it, you can't just stop production at, at a company like Salesforce. You can't say, we're not going to develop any new features now. We're just going to refactor tests, you know, for this next sprint or, or next month or two. We have to kind of sneak those into the backlog, right? Like our salespeople don't understand, you know, we're going to spend time fixing test code. Some people just don't understand that. Even though it, there's a big benefit to it in the long run, it's kind of hard to sell. So we, we have this backlog of tests. We have it sorted by priority. And so each sprint, we, we ask the team to, you know, take two or three and just refactor it, right? Um, anytime we find a duplicate test, um, we run code coverage with it. We can say, hey, this, these tests are duplicates. Let's delete them. You know, that's a great win for us. It's really easy, uh, low-hanging fruit. So, what are the current results that we have? You know, it's still a work in progress. It, it's not done yet. I mean, 30, 35,000 Selenium tests, you know, trying to migrate those. Uh, even though we have, you know, 100 teams and they're doing, you know, two or three per, uh, per sprint, to date we have about 5,000 tests that have been migrated. You know, that's not a lot. But 5,000 tests is larger than most people's like complete Selenium suite, not just you know refactored Selenium suite. Um, not only that, but since we're continuously developing new features and, and new enhancements, you know we have thousands of new web driver tests um, that have been added to our uh, backlog. The great thing about migrating to um, to web driver though is each one of our tests is able to be ran on you know all the different browsers. Um, at Salesforce, a lot of our customers are our enterprise customers, right? So it's a huge, huge um, use of Internet Explorer. A lot of companies don't really have that problem. Maybe they only run by Firefox, but uh, we have to ensure that our number one customer, our number one browser is definitely being tested. With Selenium RC, we weren't able to do that very well, but uh, with WebDriver, we're able to. But not only that, now that we have the metrics and now that we have the, uh, the uh, data of what's test our Selenium RC test, versus which uh, test or web driver test, we're actually able to split up that suite. Um, the great thing about that is instead of you know, taking 10 hours for the full Selenium RC uh, suite to run, we can run, run these uh, web driver tests separately and they get back some, some kind of faster results. Again, um, our main job is to make people more productive. If they have results back faster, they're able to act on that faster, they're able to do a lot more with it. Um, so there's a, a lot of great stuff going on. Um, Beyond refactoring tests, Salesforce is, is investing heavily in new technologies. Um, so we're going really big into dynamic uh, testing infrastructure. Um, we have, for each run, our, our, 
our testing infrastructure is thousands of dynamically generated test instances. Uh, we're going from an older technology to a newer technology. Um, we're also embracing the Selenium Grid. Uh, Dima is going to be giving a talk after lunch about Selenium Grid. I encourage you to go to, to listen to that one. Um, but essentially, we want a huge farm of uh, dynamically generated uh, Windows browsers of different flavors uh, connected to the Selenium Grid that our tests can connect to. Um, right now, we do a lot of static instances uh, for our test suites. We want to get away from that. Um, part of you know trying to make developers more productive is to eliminate infrastructure problems. Uh, whenever you're on running tests against static instances, uh, you're running to your, your test might fail for benign reasons, right? Um, a test might fail because you know a previous test didn't clean up, or maybe the browser before didn't close. You know, there's a lot of a lot of problems that can happen. Um, not only that, but we're moving our existing. Um, or we want to move our existing uh, Selenium test framework um, from an older uh, Salesforce hacked uh, JNU3 framework into something that is faster and and more lightweight. Right now, our right now our framework is really tightly coupled into, into our app code. Uh, so if you look at some of our tests, they're they're calling uh, Salesforce, you know, Java classes directly instead of using APIs. Uh, we want to move away from that. Uh, we want to make it completely abstracted away from our app code. Um, if we're able to do that, if we're able to uh, use all our, of our publicly available API jars that we have, uh, we'll be able to, be able to uh, open source it at that point. Uh, and that's cool because you know we have thousands upon thousands of customers that use Salesforce, and a lot of them have custom workflows, uh, custom um, uh, data that that are using on Salesforce, and maybe they've created their own apps and put them on App Exchange or something like that. But if we're able to open source this testing framework and let our customers um, uh, test their workflows uh, through WebDriver and, and this framework, it's just a win for us, right? Um, because not only are, are we testing our code ourselves, they're testing their code. And if they find a problem before they're doing some type of release on like their app on the app exchange, they can send us an email or a call and we're able to fix that for them. It's a pretty cool process. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting how Selenium started and, and the web driver uh, transition happened at Salesforce. So like, around 2008, I said we, you know, we started WebDriver or started uh, Selenium RC. And then around 2000, I don't know, 10, 11, you know, someone said, hey, you know, WebDriver is going to be a really cool thing. Let, let's try and get a prototype of that. And so they weren't really thinking about the scale of, you know, how it was going to happen in the future. They were mostly saying, hey, I want to prototype this. I want to... I want to get this proof of concept out as quickly as possible. So instead of architecting it in a way where it was completely separate, um, they put the WebDriver code in the same Selenium based test as uh, the Selenium RC tests were. So uh, it, it's, we, need, we need to uh, refactor that as well, get that into its own uh, separate classes, and you know, do a lot, of, a lot of stuff around there. Um, so going forward, there's, there's going to be a lot of different things that we can do. So. I think one thing that people might want to hear about is, you know, you might be in our, the same situation that we are. You, you have a big backlog of Selenium RC tests. Like, how do you get people to uh, understand that it's worth the time and effort to refactor that test? A lot of times, executives, you know, we, we tell them, you know, that our RC suites are a problem. We tell them it takes a long time. Um, we tell them that it, it takes a long time to, you know, debug our tests or refactor them, or um, maybe we can't release as often as we want to because our test suites take so long. But uh, whenever we we try to explain that we want to take um, maybe a month or so to uh, to refactor our uh, same RC suites, they look at that number and say, no, no we're not going to do that. We're not going to take the time. It's not worth the money. So a lot of times people just completely delete their same RC suites and, and, and start over. I'm not a big fan of the idea. Um, there's a lot of useful uh, data that those uh, old test suites have. Um, so I'm a big fan of you know, trying to systematically uh, refactor tests and you know, move them over to a, a faster testing framework. Um, so the first thing you have to understand is you have to be data driven. You can't just have hunches. You have to be able to go to an executive and say, hey, you know, our test suite takes X amount of times. And it's because of 10% you know, of our tests that take over you know, two minutes each or something like that. Um, you have to understand why your tests are slow. Is it because it's the MRC suite itself? 
uh, is it because the way that you're writing your test? Are you doing really long running tests or, or are you uh, using the API to generate your test data and then just using WebDriver to verify that data exists correctly? Um, you have to be able to figure out what your problem areas are. What I mean by that is, if you're able to historically look at your, your CI build and uh, your, your test failures and, and see a trend over time of, uh, of which tests fail the most often, you know, th that's a huge, uh, huge data point uh, to have. Um, and, and you have to be able to figure out you know, why those tests fail, right? So not only are you looking at which tests fail the most often, you have to under understand why they fail. Um, if it's an infrastructure problem, you know, that's one thing that's completely outside of your test suite, right? Um, if, it's an, if it's an infrastructure problem, then you can go to your ops team or your networking team and you know, try and figure that out. Um, so then you need to collect, once you have the metrics or once you know what kind of metrics that you, you want to talk about, um, you have to collect those, right? You have to put them in a meaningful way. Um, lucky with us um, at, at Salesforce, you know, they gave me the, uh, the leeway to take a few months to you know, put in the test code that I needed to, to put in the, the classes that I needed to and the methods that I needed to, to, uh, to generate those metrics. Um, and then you have to put them in a, like a tool that we use, like I said, Gus, uh, put them somewhere where people can easily see those metrics and easy, easily act on that. Um, one thing that you have to kind of explain is, you know, when a test fails, like one of the biggest time sinks is trying to figure out why that test failed. Uh, trying to debug why something failed. Um, a lot of times a test will fail on our, on our CI process, then they run it locally and it, and it passes. So why does that happen? Um, and if you can get some kind of concept or, or wrap your head around the idea of how many hours per release or per day or, or per sprint are um, spent troubleshooting your uh, Selenium RC tests, that, that's probably the most important data fact that you can generate. Um, if you're able to say you were spending, you know, 10 man, 10, 10 man days per release, you know, fixing test code, you know, people are going to be able to act on that. That's something that someone can grasp that's, that maybe doesn't actually uh, write tests, but if you're saying we're wasting 10 days per uh, release, you know, people are going to act on that. Um, and some of the benefits of, of this refactor, I mean, it's pretty obvious, but um, if you can release more often, um, we're gonna be able to get more benefits and, and more features out to customers. Um, if you can release more often, whenever an issue does happen or whenever a bug is found, um, you can get your change list up through the CI process faster. Um, and then whenever you, you push out that, that hot fix, um, you're a little more confident in it, right? Like, you, okay, it passed all of our Selenium tests, it passed over our integration tests. Um, you can get that result back in an hour or something like that. You can push out that code. You have some level of confidence that uh, it's not going to completely break your, uh, your production. And again, um, find out how much money can be saved by not debugging existing tests. Um, executives care, one thing, a lot is money, right? They don't want to waste money. They don't want to spend time, um, time, uh, you know, figuring out, uh, sorry, uh, they don't want to uh, spend time wasting, you know, hearing people saying, oh, our Selenium uh, test suites aren't great, you know, why? why? Uh, they want hard data, they, they want hard numbers, and, you know, it's up to us to explain to them, um, you know, why this needs to happen. So, uh, with that, um, did any of y'all have any questions? I, I'd love to hear your questions. Uh, if you have any uh, concerns or thoughts, or if you're trying to go do this migration yourself. Uh, uh, I, I have one question, like you mentioned about uh, code coverage, mm -hmm. uh, and then identifying duplicacy. Uh, right. Using that code coverage. Huh? So I was wondering like, what type of tool you use for identifying like, which UI, I mean, which Selenium test is covering what type of code. Uh, how did you get that code coverage piece? Right. Uh, so code coverage at, um, is anywhere, there's multiple tools that you can uh, use. I mean, there's like uh, Emma, there's Kobatora, Jococo, um, things like that. Um, the way that we're able to generate the, that metrics is um, kind of not necessarily using our existing CI process and our auto builds. We have a completely separate run uh, set up to, to do that. Uh, one of the coll colleagues on Greg and I's team, uh, his name's Patel, he developed a system called Argus that runs each test serially. 
Um, so it's kind of not the most efficient process. So maybe one day we'll discover a better way to do that. But essentially, you can, we have all our Java code. Uh, we compile it, uh, say, with like Emma, you know, uh, the code being in there. And then we run each one of our tests serially. And then we can collect that data. So we know which test hit we, which piece of the app code. Um, so then we can collect that data and put it into a database and kind of correlate that data together. Um, a lot of times, we're not going to find the exact same test, right? I mean, they're not going to test everything exactly. Um, but they're going to be similar enough that we can say, hey, you know, we don't need, you know, two or three of these, right? Um, so then we can go ahead and delete two of them, um, take that one test, put it into our backlog, and refactor that later. Yeah, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I, I wish I could tell you exactly what we're, do we're doing in the future. Um, for right now, I think I can say that we have a very large server farm of static instances that we have. Um, so pretty much just bare metal machines that we have in a data center server, right? Um, you know, thousands and thousands of them that we have hooked up to our, what we call auto build. It's, it's our internal CI system. Um, but not only that, um, can I talk about VMware? Well, I said VMware, so why not? Uh, we, uh, our older dynamic infrastructure is based on VMware. So what happens is whenever a change list needs to be tested, um, the, the batched, batched change list will say, um, okay, I have these change lists. You know, I need this type of infrastructure to be brought up. So it'll bring up an app and DB server. Uh, it'll bring up, uh, say, six instances of, of some type of Windows VM per Sony M run, right? Um, so again, we break up our Selenium runs by browser type. Um, so six instances of six serve basically uh, Selenium slaves uh, for IE8, for IE9. Um, then we run all of our tests against you know those different browsers. Um, we're going to something newer, more dynamic. Uh, we've we've invested a lot of money into a new uh, technology that's coming out, um, not to use on production, but just for our testing infrastructure. Uh, it's really cool and, and exciting, but. PR said I couldn't talk about it right now for some reason. Um, but I'm sure you can guess it's one of the really cool new, uh, new uh, open source uh, dynamic frameworks out there. Um, we, we've invested millions of dollars into it, and we're going to invest millions of dollars more into it. Um, but yeah, every single uh, run gets an entire dynamic uh, uh, stack and you know, test and resources brought up into it. And it's all done through several data centers that we have. Right. Uh, when I mentioned WebDriver, it's solely page object based. So we did a really great job with our implementation of WebDriver. Maybe not in the classes that we put it into, um, but in, in our page object uh, way that we wrote it. Um, all of our WebDriver tests are, are done through uh, page objects. The great thing about that is, um, like, I'm sure you all know about page objects, but it's basically abstracting your test away from like the back end, you know, WebDriver code itself. Um, so whenever a test fails, um, say 10 tests fails for one particular bug, instead of having to edit 10 different tests, you can just edit the page object and all of a sudden your 10 different tests are, are working. Um, so there's a couple things that we do whenever we uh, refactor a test. Um, not only do we convert it to, uh, to WebDriver or in the page object framework, but we also see if we can test it in a, a, a different level of test. I mentioned the J, uh, X unit framework for JS unit testing. Um, we try and look at the test and say, you know, what is this really doing? Is it, is it really testing Bidges logic? Um, if so, can it be an, uh, an integration test? Um, is it t just testing JavaScript? W what I've seen is a lot of people just test JavaScript with uh, WebDriver or Selenium. Um, if it's solely testing JavaScript and like clicks and you know what happens after the click or you know animations or something like that, uh, we can actually migrate that down to uh, an X unit test. The great thing about the X unit test and X unit framework is one test takes microseconds to run. Um, I think we have like 10,000 tests and it runs in under a few seconds. Um, so it's really lightweight, really, really quick. Um, so not only do we just say, hey, we're going to migrate this, migrate this over to a web driver, we, we're trying to see if there's some other kind of test suite that we can uh, run it in.
because no matter how much faster WebDriver is than Selenium RC, there's test suites that are even faster than WebDriver. So we try and make that uh, determination as well. How many times do we run our failed tests? Right, I know, we run it at least once. Do you, Greg, do you? Yeah, it's kind of a complicated one to solve for other companies that expect it to last for like, last or after a certain amount of cycles to do that. So a test will fail, we'll rerun it, put it in, we'll flag it into something that we call Yoda. It's basically like our uh, a test failure, or test run logic, right? Um, it collects that data over time, and then you know we're able to determine, you know, what we need to do with that test. And if it's a flapper test, we can go in and refactor it. If it's the test just needs to be deleted, we can delete it. Uh, if there's something about the code or the infrastructure dealing with that test, you know, we, we can address it there there as well. Um, but the reason that we had to, had to develop Yoda is, that, is again we batch all these change lists together and, and run them as you know a big group. Maybe there's one or two, or maybe there's like 20 or 30 change lists in each run. Um, so we developed this Yoda technology that can, you know, look at look at the tests, see what tests they're hitting or what files they're hitting, uh, see, see what kind of change lists have historically been, you know, dealt with those tests. And it's a big, complicated process. We have an entire team, just like three or four people, that that's all they do is trying to to figure out, you know, why the heck our our tests fail, and try and get that out programmatically. Um, so yeah, it's a big deal for us, and it's a pretty cool tool that we have. I'm sorry. Uh, no, we, uh, we actually do only. Uh, I mean, Salesforce is a big Java company, right? I mean, obviously we have other products that are investigating newer technologies. Um, we've bought a lot of companies along the way. I mean. People don't know that we own Heroku, right? I mean, that's a pretty cool company, pretty cool uh, newer technology, newer stacks. Uh, but for, for the most part, our platform is written in a Java uh, language. Um, and again, each one of our QE engineers is pretty much a, a developer at heart. A lot of them used to be, you know, feature developers, but you know, they have really a, a big passion for you know testing or something like that. Um, so they're all, you know, pretty knowledgeable. So we, we don't really try and abstract it away from Cucumber, like with Cucumber, or, you know, anything like that. Um, they're actually writing real Java, you know, test classes. Um, again, using the page object framework, so it's a little bit abstracted. Um, so, you, you know, you create your page objects for a certain page, you put in all your uh, web driver code in that page object, and then the actual tests themselves are, are just interacting with the page object and doing some type of verification. Uh, but no, we don't use Cucumber or anything like that. Yeah, so again, like I said, this is just a platform, right, of what I was talking about. Um, there's a, historically, a Salesforce has been one huge application, one huge code base. Um, there's really significant effort going on right now to mavenize our entire build and to break out certain, um, certain projects and certain features into their own code base and, um, and their own CI processes and then put them into like a Nexus repository. And then whenever the main app runs, you know, pulling down those compiled jars and, you know, like that, um, but yeah, our, our testing infrastructure. I mean, thankfully, we, I work for a company like Salesforce where they can invest millions of dollars into our testing infrastructure. Uh, so, so yeah, we do have a pretty significant. Uh, I don't think I can get into specifics. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll, we have thousands of uh, instances, right? Yeah, um, so we have thousands of instances. Uh, again, we invested in a newer technology, and it, it's going to significantly I increase our existing uh, testing capability. So a lot of really cool things that we're going to do with it. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned with the DM over here, we did move to page object. Um, one thing is web driver tests in general are, are much faster than Selenium RC tests. Uh, with, the, with the older Selenium RC tests, it does JavaScript injection into the browser. Yeah, I, I mean, my question is, uh, how did you manage the data part of it? Redata? Uh, how did you manage the data part of it? Redata? Because it's like the data part of 
Okay, um, so essentially uh, what we did is we used the data to collect you know, information on, on the particular test to put it into a backlog, a Q type system to see what we wanted to refactor first, right? Um, so we have a nice backlog, you know, each test broken down by team and it's sorted by priority versus, you know, how long it, they take to run, you know, how many times it's failed and different things like that into the, the, the backlog system, right? Um, so that's pretty much where we, we collected that data and then we put it into the system that I mes mentioned before, Gus. Um, so we have a big, nice backlog along with all that data uh, available to each one of the scrum teams. And again, e each team kind of pulls back from that pulls from that log each sprint, refactors a couple of tests, and goes from there. Um, to make sure that what we did actually works, uh, we collect data on the, on the newer test as well. Um, so as I mentioned, we were able to separate out our uh, Selenium RC tests from our WebDriver tests. Uh, so we're able to collect that same data on our WebDriver suite now. Uh, so we have you know, a database of information on our tests, on our current WebDriver test as well. Assertions for the web for the web driver test themselves or for the data? Uh, yeah, we we abstract that away. Uh, we don't want our test suite to do anything more than test, right? Uh, so essentially, it runs. It, we send all our data to something that internally we call Cloudy Boy or, or Paper Boy. It's basically an API uh, on top of a database. So each one of our test results go into a database, and then um, again, we're Salesforce, so we can do a lot of cool reporting with with our data. Uh, so we're able to do a, a lot of really cool metrics, a lot of cool, you know, spreadsheets and reports uh, based on that information. Uh, so we have historically we have a static. Uh, static server farm where um, you know they're always up and running. Um, it's our older implementation. So if a test runs on that, uh, those VMs are just up and running. And all we do is inject um, like server information into the environment. Um, it goes into our WebDriver test suites, and you know it says you know what what server am I going to hit? It goes and it just hits against that. Uh, with our newer implementations and VMware and the one that's coming out um, per run, we dynamically spin up everything. Um, so we don't have any stagnant instances in our in our new systems. Uh, each commit gets, you know, again like per per WebDriver build, they get six uh, six uh, dynamic instances. So say for IE8, IE9, IE10, each one of those will just automatically spin up uh, six new Windows images. Uh, but not only that, we spin up a brand new uh, App and DB uh, instance as well. Uh, the App and DB obviously runs the uh, uh, code that's supposed to be tested. That asks, and that also uh, acts as our test runner as well. Uh, so with, with the newer implementation, everything is being run on, on pristine, uh, dynamically generated instances. Exactly, uh, we're huge on, on mobile. Uh, again, one of our, one of the, uh, our employees is uh, one of the committers for Solenoid, which is the Android version of WebDriver. Um, I, I, I gave the caveat that we were just, just talking about the platform. Um, but we have a huge infrastructure uh, dealing with um, uh, mobile testing as well. I'm sorry? Uh, it's some kind of a mixture of both. Uh, one thing that I'm actually exploring right now, um, I don't know if you've, uh, have you seen Jason Huggins' uh, Tapster bot? Um, basically it's, it's a web driver on top of like an iPhone. It has like this cool like uh, uh, Raspberry Pi based servo system to actually interact with the screens. Um, again, that's like I said, our, our team likes to explore these new, new kind of cool technologies, and um, that's one thing that I'm exploring right now. So we have physical devices, we have emulators. Um, sometimes we use Sauce Labs, you know, uh, to do a lot of our mobile testing. Uh, there's a lot of cool things that we do. Automatic uh, layout testing. So. I don't, each sprint we collect something called a gold standard where we kind of take screenshots of you know, our releases, um, but we don't really have an automated way right now to, uh, to kind of correlate uh, that information. I mean, obviously one of the cool things about WebDriver is you can crawl through pages, you can take screenshots, and there's a lot of cool things you could do with that. Um, and in 
then if you have a gold standard of what a page should look like, I mean, it, it's sort of trivial to kind of compare and contrast, you know, between what WebDriver says is, is current versus what it should be. Uh, but currently, we don't really have anything like that. Um, it would be something that we, we could explore in the future. And on Salesforce, we can create custom objects and objects. Mm -hmm. So with every release, how do you ensure that you know, they are all working well? The crazy, so there's a lot of custom objects that our, our employees have, right? Um, so much so that you know, we can't necessarily test every single custom object for every single CI run, right? Um, not only that, there's you know customer specifics, you know, on on separate pods that you know they don't necessarily want us to touch, right? That's their own information. Uh, but we try. Uh, we use something called um, d uh, dots, uh, like data on template or, or something like that. Uh, where basically we can take an organization, we can take a bunch of custom objects, uh, we take a bunch of test data and, and kind of zip it up into one file. And then for each test, literally for each test, we create a new organization, new custom objects, everything uh, for that test. And we're, so in that respect, we're able to test against custom objects, uh, custom workflows, custom or organizations, uh, without having to do that through the, through the UI. We don't have to set up through the UI. Everything is set up uh, through that dot. Um, and we're continuously improving that dot. We're, we're taking um, you know, customer data, we're, we're, we're taking these things, we're, we're combining into the dot, so we're continuously testing new workflows and um, new data. Uh, we don't use it for uh, like load testing and things like that. Uh, same, there, there's better tests out there for them, I mean, like JMeter test, and you know we have some uh, custom tools that we've built in house. Uh, <laughs> WebDriver and Selenium tests are great for you know testing that something comes up when it's supposed to test, right? Um, I'm not a big fan of, of using it for load testing. Um, there's just a lot of lot of intricacies and a lot of things that happen if WebDriver going through, through the JSON wire, you know, talking to the browser, talking to the different instances. There's a lot of stuff on top of that that uh, would get in the way of like a true load test. Um, but we do have load testing that we do at Salesforce, just not through, uh, through WebDriver. Cool, I think we're done. Uh, yeah, thank you all so much.